is now fulfilled by the passing of that time. And at that point, they declare us intestate. What if that is the public equivalent to declaring us dead to commerce? Now, if we're dead to commerce, we are dead. Well, if, if, if seven years have passed and there's no record, then legally under Sesta K in its original form, we are dead. We are intestate. What does that then allow them to do legally? Very simply, without getting into the complexity of the ecclesiastical ritual. Well, it means that they can presume to administer the estate. It means that they can presume the role of being the executor. Why? Because we do not have a will. We don't have a will. We might have a document called a will with a lawyer, but unless it's recorded as a deed, we don't have a will. What does it also mean when we go to a court? It means when we enter a court, we're dealing with probate. Every court, we're dealing with probate. When we enter a court, we are still intestate. It means that when we stand up and say, I'm the executor, do we have a will? No. In the absence of a will, we're just noise in their system. We have absolutely no standing in their system. And in one respect, that is how simple it is. Now, in order to allow us to survive, even though they declare us dead, they give us a token. And I'll discuss birth certificates now to get that out of the way because I know this keeps getting raised over and over again. If they do, in fact, declare us intestate and by the descriptions tonight and what we've said, the evidence appears overwhelming that they declare us intestate at this age, around the age of seven, what is the token they give us that is effectively a certificate or a license to engage as an enemy in banking and in commerce? Again, it's a rhetorical question. And the answer is a birth certificate. That's the first piece and the first token they give us so that we can at least survive even though we are declared intestate. Now, one of the things about being declared intestate, and at this point, when they declare us that, we are effectively also declared a ward, is it means that any assets that are the rightful inheritance of the estate are held effectively in escrow. They are held and cannot be touched. Now, how many times have we heard that under our constitutions, we are entitled to a share of the common wealth, that is, the collective wealth of the land to which we were born? Well, I'm sure this is true. In fact, I'm certain this is true. There is certainly enough evidence to suggest that that is precisely part of our inheritance. As are rights granted under the Constitution, property. But if we are intestate, then all those rights, all that property is held in escrow, held uh, in effectively the same equivalent to bankruptcy, in, in uh, purgatory, in limbo, until probate is completed. And of course, probate, in our case, can't be completed until there is proof of death. And what is the proof of death in their system? That's right, the death certificate. So until the death certificate is issued, we remain intestate. And we can never touch those rights, those inheritances to our estate that we know we are entitled to under the constitution of the land in which we were born. Brilliant, simple, straightforward. Now back to birth certificates. So in order for us to survive, they give us a token. 
No, I know in, in the last week there's been some discussion because registrars uh, are, exist in different places and people speak to registrars and registrars say certain things. And there is still the confusion, and I might add the deliberate confusion, not by those that are trying to uncover it, but I believe those that are employed in the system, not the least of which are registrars and deputy registrars, as to is a birth certificate a valuable token? Well, it is in one respect, because without it, you can't get a bank account. Without it, you can't get a driver's license. Without it, you can't do a whole range of things to survive. So as a token, yes, I would say a birth certificate is important. You can't get a passport. Talk to someone that was not born without a birth certificate and see how easy life is. On the one hand, they're free. They're not on the registrar of, of slaves, of paupers. But on the other hand, they can't get the normal day-to-day -day services that we take for granted. So in that respect, there is a certain value. But as to the birth certificate as a security instrument, and it is, in one respect, a security instrument, it is only a security instrument to the private monopoly game of private exchanges where you need to be an authorised member to play and an authorised official to reap any kind of benefits. You know, when people talk about, uh, I have a promissory note for a million dollars or a billion dollars or I created a bond, that's all fine. You have every right to create instruments. But what they did, and we spoke about this last week, the concept of enclosure, what they did was that they created their own private exchanges, their own private monopoly. The DTC is a private system. Unless you are granted not only a QCIP number, but are then granted the right to trade, the license to trade, then you can't trade. And this is the point about the birth certificate on their side being security. It may well be uh, traded as a token of some valuable bond associated with us, but we don't have any access to that until we address the question of being in intestate. So I hope those issues of birth certificate are cleared up. As far as it is concerned for us on this side of the equation, it is a necessary token for survival, but it certainly doesn't represent anything of great value. If anything, a holder of a birth certificate is acknowledging, openly acknowledging that they are a pill, they are a pauper, they are indebted, they are a slave, a debt slave. So back to intestate. All right, so they declare that at the age of seven. They tell us, public knowledge, you need a will. They tell us what happens if we don't have a will. They ensure the lawyers keep our will away from being recorded. So then let's talk about the question of what is a valid will? And what does a will represent? And what would be the importance to us of having a will recorded? So let's go through that. First off, what is a will to them? And what is a will by its simplicity? Well, a will and testament really is supposed to achieve only four things in their system. Number one, a will is supposed to identify who is appointed the executor or the general executor of the estate. Who is in charge of administering the affairs of the estate? That's number one. Number two, what is the claim of rights? By what I mean by claim of rights, what is the claim of property? If you think about it, when a will is listed, a will doesn't provide the forensic proof that you own or do not own something that is claimed in a will. You might say to John, I give my, my Plymouth, or to Mary, I give 
my home in the Bahamas. But a will doesn't seek to prove that I own the home in the Bahamas. So in that respect, on the second point of a will, a will identifies a list, a claim of right. It is, in fact, the most perfected form of claim of right. A will, third and foremost, identifies beneficiaries and the benefits that we wish to provide nominated parties. And fourth, most importantly, a will identifies the rules of administration of the estate because the will and testament is the trust deed of a, of a trust and the estate is the collection of trusts belonging to the trust corpus. And we described what we meant by estate last week and the week before, that an estate is, is a particular way of describing the trust corpus uh, of a trust where it is divided into real estate, real property, and personal estate, personal property, and that there is at least two trusts involved in the trust corpus. So a will and testament is a trustee. Absolutely, it's a trustee. So describe the executor, list the claim of rights, define the beneficiaries, and tell us the rules of administration. They are the key things that a will are supposed to do. Now, in terms of the executor, we can nominate not only the general executor today, but we can also nominate a list of general executors that may be appointed if the previous general executor or executor is unable to perform their duties. So we may say, uh, under our will, we appoint Franco Collins as the general executor of the Franco Collins estate. And if he is unable to perform his duties, uh, that Joe Bloggs, is appointed the general executor of his state. And if he is unable to perform his duties, such and such is appointed the general executor. So you can do that. I wouldn't suggest you go ad nauseum, but certainly in that manner, you cover the administration of the estate today and into the future when your flesh has long since departed this earth. Now, in claims of right, and this may seem an odd way of describing the list of property, but in claims of rights, it's important to identify what rights you are inherited, what private rights you have, and what rights are granted to you. And we will be providing templates on how to prepare a will with these elements in place so that you can encompass those areas of our will. In beneficiaries, there is the way to identify how benefits are applied to different beneficiaries and how that is uh, defined clearly. Now, I mentioned the fourth one, the fourth key to a, a trust, the fourth key to a will, is the rules of administration. And guess what? Every single will created by lawyers have one consistent theme. They do not list the rules of administration, even though that is a fundamental purpose of a will. They don't list the rules of administration. Why? Well, if a will does not list the rules of administration, then what then can be presumed to be the rules of administration? That's right, the public statutes of the public trustees. Brilliant. So one of the jobs of the lawyers is not only to stop us getting our will recorded so that we have a will to negate the presumption of being intestate, but another is to ensure that we do not nominate rules of administration that prevent them from diminishing the effect of the will. Because if the rules of administration are public statutes, guess what? In the public statutes, they give lawyers and they give judges more particularly the power to rewrite wills. And that's what judges are doing all the time. Negating the intent of wills. Why? Because without rules of administration, the public statutes become the rules of administration. And through those rules, they can administer the trust to the point that basically they may see 